1 Thessalonians 2, commencing at verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost." But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoured more eagerly to see you, to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. I have a question. And the question is where we're going to be focusing our message out of this reading today. And the question is simply this. And before you answer it very quickly and glibly, I want you to think deeply on it. The question is, do you believe that the Bible is God's word? Do you believe that the Bible is God's word? Do you really believe that God communicated directly with his creation through words that have been written down by something like 40 authors over a period spanning many centuries? Do you believe that those words were inspired by the Holy Spirit? They're inspired as they were written and they are inspired as they are read to us and guided by the Holy Spirit. That God can speak directly to us out of the pages of the scriptures and help us to apply his word to our lives today. It's an important question. It's a vital question. I wonder what would happen if we all decided, hey, we're going to go out, we're going to survey our neighbourhood, going to head on up to the, the mall at Oakley there, and we're going to ask people this question, do you believe that the Bible is God's word? If we went, walked through Chadston, saw the hundreds, maybe thousands of people in the shopping centre there, and we asked them, do you believe that the Bible is God's word? I reckon we'd get a pretty mixed response. We might get some odd looks we might even get a little more than that. You're going to discover that that little more than that would be a good thing, but we'll find out about that further down as we study this today. Well, that might be all right for out there, but surely here in a Baptist church, if we were to ask that question, I hope we would get a fairly favourable answer. But what we're going to be looking for today as we study this It's not just a favourable answer. Yes, I believe that the Bible is God's word. But what we're looking for is actions. What we're looking for is the evidence that declares that this is indeed what we believe, that the Bible is God's word, his word to us personally today. The new believers in Thessalonica that we've been talking about, we've been studying about over these recent weeks. They believed that the Bible is God's word. Here in this passage today, we see that Paul comes to them and he commends them for their belief and acceptance of the word of God. And Paul points to the evidence 
that not only did they believe it in their mind, but they were committed to it with their actions. They were committed to read the word of God. They were committed to understand the word of God and they were committed to apply the word of God, the Bible, to their lives. And as a result, their lives changed. Their eternities changed. And also, as a result of that, it was infectious. It was passed on. Infectious is a bad word today, 2021. We can't use a word like that, but we know what it means, don't we? It was passed on to other people. Because the Thessalonian Christians believed that the Bible is God's word, they committed themselves to it wholeheartedly. They studied it, they read it, they understood it. And they didn't only understand it up here, but they took it to heart. They put it to work in their lives. And as a result, their life changed. As a result, people noticed. And then other people believed. They were saved. They too became believers that multiplied. As a result, the gospel spread throughout the region. As a result, the gospel has continued spreading for 2,000 years. And so my question to us today is, what would it take for that sort of thing to happen here amongst us at Oakley? What would it take for us to have that kind of impact in our community around about us, where people notice us and they put their faith in Jesus? As I was preparing for today, I came across across a quote out of World War I, the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Gray, made a statement that maybe had a little bit of application to the world in which we live when it comes to thinking about the Bible. He wasn't talking about the Bible, he was talking about what was happening in the war that was coming upon the whole world. And he said this, he said, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Now, the Bible tells us Jesus is the light of the world, and we believe that. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the living word of God, and we believe that too. We know that the best way to discover and follow Jesus is through the pages of the Bible, as we read it, as we apply it to our lives. And if that's true, if the Bible is that important, then I think it may be fair to say that the lights are going out all over Melbourne, all over Australia, even all over the world, at least the Western world at the moment, because our Bibles are remaining closed. What's saddest of all is that lamps seem to be going out in our churches, and that is almost unforgivable, because if we really believe that the Bible is the word of God, the way that God best speaks to us today. And if we keep that Bible closed, we're missing out on hearing God speak to us. The sad reality is many Christians today don't hold to the authority of the Bible. What's sadder still is that those that do, or at least those that say they do, don't live like it. And so I want to ask you again, do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? Do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? And now I want to ask my second question. Is your life evidence that you believe that the Bible is the word of God? Because if we want to be believers who are living loud, that's the, that's the title of our 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 series at the moment. That's believers whose faith in God is so visible that people around about us can see that. Then we absolutely have to be committed to reading and understanding and applying the Bible to our lives. Just like the Thessalonian Christians did. And it's only if that's true It's only if we are committed to reading and understanding and applying the word of God to our lives 
that people could say of us what Paul said of the Thessalonians, which has become kind of the phrase or the central verse throughout this series. The word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere. Paul said it of the Thessalonians. We want to be able to say it of ourselves. or We want people to say it of us. Here in this passage where Paul commends the Thessalonian Christians, at the, at, um, he, he, he shares his thanksgiving, his joy at how they welcomed God's word when it was declared. This is what we read in verse 13. He says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. What do we know about that period of time and, and, and Paul's work and his journeys, not only Paul, but in this case, it's Paul and Silas. Earlier, it was Paul and Barnabas. Timothy is a part of this crew as well. There are often others that are traveling, Luke and, and, and some others. over. The, um, John Mark was another one over Paul's journeys. But they would go out into the various towns and cities, Gentile territory. There were Jews scattered amongst them for sure. But, and and, and uh, all this area of, of Asia and then of Europe as well. And they would go first, that the, their plan was to preach the good news of the gospel. And they would begin by going to the Jews in the communities and in the cities if they could find them. They'd go into the synagogues and they'd teach there in the synagogues. And, and what was the Bible they had? Well, the only Bible, the only scriptures they had was the Old Testament scriptures. And there they would speak from the Old Testament and they would show and speak about who the Messiah should be and what he was, what he was to do. And then he would speak about Jesus. Real life testimony from the stories of Jesus and the people, from the things that he had seen and the things that others had seen. And, and, and he would talk to them. He'd share stories about Jesus. In particular, he would speak about Jesus' death and his resurrection to save us from our sins. He would speak about his return, after which so many of the scriptures that are still yet yet to be fulfilled would come come to pass. A lot of Christians these days don't recognize that. We kind of think that all the prophecies come to pass, then Jesus comes back and then we're there in eternity. That's the way people look at it. But a closer look at the Bible, we realize that's not how it happens. It's quite different to that. And if we understood how the Bible was written, we would discover that there are various ages and there are still ages to come. Jesus will return for the church. Then the story will continue. Some of those prophecies that are written in the Old Testament will then take place. Things that are written for us to know and to understand. This was the message that the believers received and welcomed. This was what brought such great joy to Paul and Silas and Timothy. But what's really important for us to notice is that Paul doesn't stop there by saying he heard that they were declaring with their mouth that the gospel is true, it is the word of God. What Paul points to was their actions. And we're going to see that as we unpack this reading today. Read with me from verse 13 and verse 14. Continuing, Paul says, The word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe, for you, brethren, became imitators of the church of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. So the first evidence that Paul points to and describes is that the word of God is working effectively in them. In another translation, it says it this way. It says, the word continues to work in you who believe. And so we've got to ask ourselves, is the word of God at work in us? We're only being nourished 
Um, and if, if we're actually reading the Bible and studying it and applying it to our lives. If we're only getting nourished and we think we're getting the food that we need by listening to sermons like this one or singing the words of songs as good as they are that we sang today and we try to be careful about choosing songs with appropriate words. But if that's where we're looking to be nourished, then we're going to be left hungry. We're going to be left starving, in fact. Because if we're not being nourished by God's word, then we're not going to be filled. And if we're not going to be filled by feeding on the word of God, then it's going to be very hard for anybody to look at us and say that the word is continuing to work in our lives. But it's not just about reading the Bible every day. It's about studying the Bible to understand it. And then it's about applying what we read and what we study to our lives that brings change. And it's that change that happens in our life that is the evidence that people see. And they say, the word of God is at work in us. I said before, I've been encouraging people to come and join. There's a few of us that have been attending this biblical counseling course. I'm trying to encourage as many people who possibly can to come along. I know it's hard because it's, it's a Friday night and it's an all day Saturday thing and that sometimes doesn't fit into people's lives. Between you and me, I'm looking at talking to Adrian about whether I can record something, do our own version of it so that people can, can participate in it in their own time because I believe it's that important. It's about, it's, it's learning how to, to read and to study and to learn from the Bible and to apply it to our life in order to bring godly change. We might even say that the focus of the course is about applying God's word so that it works in us. And I know if you've missed module one, it's not too late to join. Um, I'd love to talk to you if you're interested in finding out more about that. So the first piece of evidence that declares, that shows that we believe that the Bible is God's word, that shows that we have received it and welcomed it, is that it is continuing to work in our lives. The second piece of evidence, I'm afraid, doesn't sound so pleasant, doesn't sound so nice. But I would say it is the clearest and easiest thing to see especially as the world around us gets darker. Because believing and welcoming and applying God's word to our lives will bring hostility. It'll bring confrontation. It'll bring persecution. This is what Paul writes in verse 14. He said, For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. He then goes on to point, point out, even down in verse 18, that the opposition doesn't only come from our neighbours and friends and the people around us, it comes from Satan himself. In this life, if God is at work in your life, it will bring hostility. It will bring opposition. It will bring persecution. If we're going to be believers whose faith stands out, then one of two things is going to, well, two things are going to happen. Both of these are going to happen in different circumstances. It's always been this way. It's never been any different. Where God is at work in the life of Christian is brought one of two things. It seems to polarize people around us. As we're a living example of the change that God's word makes in a person's life, the change that the Holy Spirit that comes into a person's life makes, understanding and applying that word to our life, it'll have an effect on others. There will be some people around us who are drawn to us. They like what they see. They want to find out more. They like the fact that we're loving and we're caring. They find, like the fact that we're truthful and trustworthy. They like the fact that we're honest and we live in a godly way. They like the fact that we're humble. We're not perfect, but we seek to just humbly love people as God has called us to do. We spoke about that last week 
And we said people like that are called a person of peace or people of peace. And it's a really important concept for us to understand. So if you want to find out more, go back and online and find the, find the sermon from last week where we unpack it a little bit more. But a person of peace is someone who sees something in us. They see someone living in us. They see Jesus and they're drawn to him. And as a result, we have the privilege of discipling them, of loving them, of leading them towards faith in Jesus and then helping them to grow in their faith. So that's one side. That's one thing that'll happen if we live a life appropriately. But on the other side, those who love the darkness will hate the light in us. They'll hate the truth and it'll get nasty. It'll get hostile and will be persecuted. Paul tells us in verse 13 that he, that other believers, the prophets of old, and of course, most significantly, our Lord Jesus Christ, all suffered as a result of living out the truth of God's word. And we can be certain it'll be true of us today, particularly as the world around us gets darker. And there'll be temptations that come to us. We'll be tempted to lay low. We'll be tempted to keep a low profile. We'll be tempted to follow along with the wickedness, to do what the crowd does. It's just easier to go with the current, to go with the flow. We'll accept a progressive and acceptable gospel rather than a biblical gospel. We'll be tempted to stay politically correct and keep our faith to ourselves for the sake of keeping the peace with others around us. But none of these, none of these are what believers who receive and welcome the word of God will do. I want to say something that as much as I hate hearing people, in, people suffering, Last week as we gathered in this place, I heard a story that, that just gave me great joy and great encouragement. I heard about somebody in this church that was prepared, despite the opposition, to stand up for biblical truth. It cost them. And I went, woohoo, because that's evidence that God's word is working in that person. And so I rejoiced. There's so much that we need to stand for today if we're going to be a biblical Christian. And we need to remember too that how we stand is just as important as the fact that we stand up in the first place. We must take a stand in love, a stand for truth, a stand in humility, stand against sin, but not against the sinner. We must believe that God loves everyone. He doesn't want any to perish. And that if any would repent, he can bring forgiveness and eternal life. We must take a stand knowing that everybody is responsible. Everybody is accountable before God for their actions. We must take a stand knowing that it is God who is judge and not us in that sense. And God outlines, sorry, and Paul in verse 16 outlines what happens when God comes and brings judgment. Well, if you believe that the Bible is God's word, if you've received and welcomed it, it will work in your life. It'll be transforming you. It'll be making you more and more like Jesus. We call that sanctification is the big word that speaks about the change that happens in us as we progressively apply the word of God and become more like Jesus. We've also seen how it will bring opposition and hostility and persecution, even from people around us who say that they love us. But it'll do one more thing that Paul describes in this passage, and this one is really precious, so I want to close with it. To unpack this, I want to read the last four verses of this chapter. So follow along as I read from verse 17. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoured more eagerly to see your face with great desire, Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and our joy. 
You see, believing and welcoming God's word will produce in you a love for the saints and a burden for the lost. A love for the saints, for the brothers and sisters, deep love for one another, and a burden for the lost. You know, Paul was never content. Read, read his letters, read the book of Acts, you discover one thing's really clear. Paul simply was not content with just being saved, was he? Just getting into the kingdom was not enough for Paul. He was running his race. He wanted to finish well. He wanted to please his Lord and Savior. He had a passion to take the gospel to others. He had a passion to see people grow in their faith and them too producing fruit that would lead others to faith in Jesus and so on. I believe that we need to continually fight against the temptations that I spoke about earlier, that temptation towards complacency. I believe that was the battle that Paul battled so well but so earnestly to do. The temptation to conform to the ways of the world, the ways of darkness, and the temptation to keep a low profile, just keep your head down so that people didn't bite it off. If we follow the way of these temptations, we'll miss out on the wonderful things that Paul was so passionate about and so pleased to experience. Look what he says in verse 19. He says, what is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. We want to be believers who multiply. We want to be Christians who are living loud. We want to live with a faith that is visible to people around about us. Yes, it'll bring hostility. It'll bring opposition. Absolutely. But the rewards, not only future rewards, but rewards that we get to experience today, just like Paul was experiencing them as he's writing this letter, having heard the good news that the Thessalonians who he had only spent three weeks with were going on and doing great things for the kingdom. The rewards are beyond imagining. The joy of seeing others saved and growing in faith, those rewards will be a joy to us just as they were for Paul and Silas and Timothy. They were willing to endure so much for the gospel to experience the joy that came from seeing others saved, growing in their faith and reaching out, making disciples of others. Do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Are you living in such a way that you're receiving and welcoming God's word and it's transforming work in your life? I wanna leave you with three questions. I think these three questions will help you do a bit of a stock take. They'll help you know if this is true for you. If you're living loud, if you're living with a visible faith. My first question is this. How do you see God's word working in your life? How is the Bible changing you? How are you growing in your faith, in your love for the word of God? What is the fruit that you are seeing as a result. The second question is this one. What opposition are you facing? Are you facing consequences? Are you paying a price because you're lovingly standing for the truth of God's word? Does it put you at odds with other people? And the third question. What or probably more importantly, the question is who? Who is your joy? Who is your hope? Who is your crown of rejoicing? As you think about your life, as you think about the people in it, maybe your family members, maybe your neighbours, maybe your friends, maybe your colleagues, who are you longing to share Jesus with? Who would you love to see come to faith except Jesus as their saviour? To see them fruitful and growing in faith that is visible to others. 
These are challenging questions. But I think they're important questions because they help us to know if our faith is a living faith, if we are believers who are living loud. As I close again, I, it's going to be my third and final time today, but I'll give a shout out for the biblical counselling course in just a few weeks' time. Discover how applying the word of God to our life will bring change and fruitfulness to you. As always, I want to close by sharing the gospel because we never take for granted who is with us, who might be watching online. If you are listening to this and you're thinking, I would love to know Jesus as my personal saviour, I've never personally asked Jesus to forgive my sin and accepted me as my saviour and Lord. I'd like to become a Christian. How do I do that? Well, I would say it's as easy as ABC. A stands for admit. Admit that you have sinned, that you have fallen short of God's standard. The Bible says everyone, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is perfect, not one. The only perfect human being that ever lived is our Lord Jesus Christ and he had to be perfect in order to pay the price for our sin upon the cross. So A, admit that you have sinned. It's a good place to start. Start with the truth. B stands for believe that Jesus is God. He died on the cross for your sin. That was the gospel that Paul preached. It's the same gospel that we declare as truth today. Jesus died on that cross not because he was overcome by wicked people. He died on that cross. He willingly went to the cross. In fact, he orchestrated so many of the events around it to bring it about. He could have stopped it at any moment, but he knew the only way to save us from our sin was to pay the price in our place. A sinless human being needed to do that. And so he did. Believe that Jesus is God. He died on the cross that he paid that price for your sin. Everything, all the wrong things that you've done, he has taken that punishment upon himself. And so then you just need to do the third thing, that is C, call on Jesus to save you personally. Tell him, Jesus, I know that you're God. The Bible tells me you died on that cross to save, to pay the price for my sin. Will you forgive me of my sin? Make me a part of your family. The wonderful truth of the word of God, and it says it on more than one occasion, It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What a wonderful promise. And so right now, whether you're online or whether you're here with us now, if you call on the name of Jesus for salvation, that is God's word to you. That is God's promise. Anyone can do it. Doesn't matter how bad your sin is. It matters how complete Jesus' work of salvation on that cross is. It's his power, not yours. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, do it right now. Admit you've sinned. Believe Jesus died to pay the price for your sin. Call on Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. As we close this out, I just want to remind you and point to you what I said earlier on in the service. On our website is a section called Next Steps. It's just a series of videos that help us to grow and to take next steps in our faith. The first two videos talk about becoming a Christian. The next two videos talk about baptism, which we'll be looking at um, today. Get into the last two videos. There's uh, six steps along the way. I won't tell you what all of them are. Get to the last one. It talks about how do I share the gospel with other people? Um, How do I do that? Take a look there. um, And as you're taking those steps, let me know. Send me an email. Send me a text message. Ask a a Christian brother or sister to to walk alongside with you. Tell them what you're doing. We get strength and encouragement by working together and building one another up. And again, just a reminder, before you leave today, or if you're online, before you just get on with the week, think about who you can call, who you can encourage, who haven't you seen for a while. Who would you like to ring up and say, look, I've been missing you at church. I haven't been able to get to church and I've been missing being able to see you. How are you doing? I've been praying for you. Let's encourage one another as we look forward to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me finish with a benediction. I pray that God who gives peace will make you completely holy 
And may your spirit, soul and body be kept healthy and faultless until our Lord Jesus Christ returns. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you.